Okay, hello everybody. This is Peter Cooper from the NCBI. Um, today's uh, NCBI Minute is going to be on textbooks on the NCBI bookshelf. During the webinar, if you have a question, please type it in the question spot. Uh, I will try to answer it. I'm not the one going to be presenting. Ronna Morris will be presenting. And so I'll try to answer the questions. And at the end, we'll be able to address some of them um, orally. And um, Stacey Lathrop is here from uh, Bookshelf to answer them for you. If there are questions that we don't get to, and all questions, in fact, are going to be put into a document that's going to be linked to our webinars and courses page. Um, the slides of supplemental materials and the Q&A documents are also going to be on the FTP site. Uh, and that link there, that compressed URL, will take you to the FTP site. And I'm going to turn it over now to Rana Morris, who's going to be presenting. Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to talk about textbooks that are uh, available on the NCBI bookshelf and how they got there and maybe how you can have your textbook on the bookshelf as well. Since 1999, NCBI has worked with publishers and authors to provide an additional way for readers to access their products. The NCBI bookshelf, also called Books for short, houses books, reports, documents, and other literature-based media on life sciences and health-related topics. The specific topics, or the scope, was selected by our parent organization, the U.S. National Library of Medicine. The bookshelf collects and makes available only full text works, not abstracts, for example, and they are all in English. One of the things that NCBI is known for are links provided between related pieces of information within and between resources throughout NCBI. We do this to provide a way for users of our site to learn and discover more about our their topics of interest. Since many of our databases involve biological data, it was natural to consider providing links between our databases and to biological and health related textbooks and other books on the bookshelf. These are a large number of databases that we have in various domain fields. We have long been known for our literature databases, particularly PubMed and more recently PubMed Central or PMC. We've also maintained biological sequence databases for nucleotides and proteins since 1990 and have added other sequence related databases, as well as those housing data related to genes, protein structure and activity and chemicals and uh, more recently have added several health and clinically focused databases to our suite of resources. As the years in scientific research has progressed, we're adding more and more. The NCBI Bookshelf or Books Database is another literature database which can connect to all of these resources. The link to a lot of the basic science information is perhaps one reason why textbooks have been so successfully added to and integrated within the NCBI system. So why textbooks? In fact, the NCBI bookshelf started in 1999 with a single book, an edition of one of the most respected molecular biology textbooks to have been published, the third edition of Molecular Biology of the Cell, by Bruce Alberts, Alexander Johnson, Julian Lewis, Martin Raff, Keith Roberts, and Peter Walter. The text was submitted to us for inclusion in the NCBI bookshelf by Garland Publishing with the blessing of the author. Recently, we have caught up with Bruce Alberts, the lead author of this esteemed book, who relayed to us that all of the authors in the molecular biology of the cell were pleased when Garland Publishing decided to post the third edition of our textbook on Bookshelf. And we were especially happy that this free resource has been heavily used, contributing an important U.S. effort to spread science to students across the globe. In addition to molecular biology of the cell, several other extremely popular textbooks were added early on, including Bird, uh, Tomoko and Stryer's Biochemistry, 5th edition, Barron's Medical Biochemistry, 4th edition, and Walker, Hall, and Hearst Clinical Methods, 3rd edition. All of these are considered classic textbooks, which continue to be well regarded and are still used today. A quote from one frequent user of these books, a professor teaching graduate and professional level life science and clinical courses, mentioned that, I grew up with Stryer's Biochemistry and Albert's Molecular Biology of the Cell. All you'd need to add is Lewin's genes, and I'd never leave my computer. But seriously, I've recommended the NCBI bookshelf to my students, included links to the textbooks and syllabi that incorporated graphics and tables with attribution in lectures for over 12 years now. Having access to free, high-quality textbooks is key to being able to meet the needs of my graduate, medical, and PA students. The online version of these texts include all features of the hard copy books, including graphics, images, and tables, which are some of the most heavily viewed sections of these books. 
But some say these books are old. Are they still useful? Or are they still being used? In fact, they are. In January 2018, hundreds of thousands of people were accessing and spending time looking through and reading these textbooks. There are four, these four are the, currently the most popular and used entries on the NCBI bookshelf. Okay, so faculty who have grown up with these classic texts may feel comfortable with them, but what about students that are being newly exposed to these disciplines in their undergraduate studies? Why are they still accessing these classic texts? Here's a quote from an undergraduate biochemistry major that's really representative of what we've heard from students. Sean says, I can't afford to spend $350 to $400 for a single textbook. Even if I could, carrying it around is a pain in the neck, literally. Being able to look things up on my laptop or cell phone anywhere my study group happens to be is the only way I've gotten through my biology courses. And unlike what's on most of the web, I know I can trust what I find at the National Library of Medicine. The cost factor as well as the platform for textbooks are both important factors in student usage of textbooks. In a blog post on the Wiley Network by the library director of the Western, University, uh, Western Michigan University School of Medicine, she explored student preferences and concluded that overall, we know learners sometimes prefer print, other times they prefer the electronic version, but generally surveys on the subject seem to be in agreement that having access to both an electronic and print textbook copy is optimal. At the NCBI bookshelf, we've had some new books, uh, textbooks added to our inventory in recent years. And in fact, one of them, The Essentials of Glycobiology, was unique in that it was conceived from the outset by its editors, publisher, and NCBI as a book that would be published simultaneously in print by Cold Spring Harbor Press and also made available in full text online at the NCBI bookshelf. The editors and the publisher hoped that this would serve as a worldwide model for an open education vision. They recently provided a quote to us. We were happy to have collaborated with NCBI staff whose skills and efficiency ensured our book would be discoverable and freely accessible to researchers, instructors, students, and others after simultaneous release in print and full text online with online only updates available on the NCBI bookshelf. We were very happy to work with Ajit Barkey and John Inglis on this project. But why would other publishers want to consider this type of model? Why would publishers be interested in making textbooks freely available for their customers? In a white paper published by Springer Nature in November of 2017 called The OA Effect, How Does Open Access Affect the Use of Scholarly Books? They revealed that open access, which go even further than just free online textbooks, are downloaded seven times more than any others in the first year of publication, are cited 50% more over four years, and are mentioned online 10 times more over three years. Essentially, there is a significant amount of free advertisement and marketing that organically grows from making books freely available on the internet, and this dramatically increases the potential and realized audience for these books. In a blog post exploring the data in this white paper, Books in the OA Effect, One Publisher's Perspective, they mentioned that in addition to free advertising and expanded audience, which benefited the publisher, two other groups seem to strongly support this movement for free online open access book availability. Funders or sponsors were motivated by specific ethical considerations that publicly funded research should be open for the public to read. They were also interested in fulfilling their and their author's expectations for finding mechanisms to reach a larger audience. Author's motivations included improving access to research information, enhancing dissemination to a wider, broader audience, and also providing a way for students to be impacted by their work at low cost. The links to both the white paper and the blog are there on the slide. At NCBI, we can help you do all of this what the NCBI bookshelf can do for you. So here's what we hope to do. Make your textbook findable and usable for anyone, anywhere. It's on the internet. Optimize the indexing of your book in Google and in PubMed to make it easy to find. Enable viewing in any web browser via scrolling web style pages. And we also have an ebook style pub reader that often makes it, the books easier to read. We also hope to expand your audience to more than just college classes who have already adopted your textbook because they can access it as well. 
Here's the view of Katherine Jenkins, who is the Open Access Books work Workflows Coordinator at the publisher Springer Nature, who has submitted many, many books which are available on the NCBI bookshelf. The NCBI bookshelf offers an additional route for wider discoverability for our open access books and welcome funded OA chapters and helps to direct traffic through these to the texts hosted on our own platform, Springer Link. The HTML display on the device agnostic platform is user friendly and renders our books in easily navigable sections to create a best in class online reading experience. We value our collaboration. So to summarize, NCBI Bookshelf can increase the discoverability of your text and provide a link to help readers find your own site and resources. And we're a good collaborative partner who is able to present your work online for a great reader experience. Are you interested? What do you need to know about getting your book on the NCBI Bookshelf? First, please keep in mind the scope of the works uh, as specified by the U.S. National Library of Medicine. We take books about life sciences and health related topics, and they must be in English and need to be in full text, not just abstracts or citations. Who can apply to have their book included in the NCBI bookshelf? The applications to include the book must be driven by the copyright holder of the text. However, that copyright holder needs to make sure that all participating members of the team agree on the submission, including authors, editors, publishers, funders, and or sponsors. So to begin the application process, you can download an application from the NCBI website. There's also a new sub for new submitters, a publisher application form as well to fill out. Once those are filled out, you can submit it to the bookshelf via email, which I will provide shortly. It is important also to provide details of the work, including the title and an abstract for the book, as well as bios for the editor and authors, and a copy of the book for review. For printed books, this should either be two hard copies or an electronic PDF version of the book. For eBooks, you can send in either the electronic files or the URL for accessing these files. Actually, if you just go to the NCBI Bookshelf homepage, you can find links to all sorts of helpful information, including a whole section for people who want to have their books on the bookshelf, including a whole set of documents as to how to apply. There's also info for people who want to learn how to use the bookshelf, including a quick start guide, and FAQs that answer really common questions that people want to know. Can I use figures from the bookshelf? How do I cite books from the bookshelf? Can a publisher also provide their work on other sites in addition to the bookshelf? By the way, hint, hint, the answer is yes. So in conclusion, we've got a couple of direct URLs for you. The NCBI Bookshelf's homepage that you just saw, as well as links to other helpful documentation. Again, these are linked directly on the homepage from the bookshelf, so you can start there. Here is the direct link for the information for authors and publishers and how to apply. If you have additional questions or inquiries, you can reach the NCBI Bookshelf staff directly at this email, bookshelf at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. And as with all of our NCBI Minute webinars, we'd like to finish with a place that you can go to learn more about any of our NCBI's various resources. The NCBI Insights blog, the NCBI YouTube channel, and for any uh, questions, general questions about NCBI, you can always send it in to the info at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov address. Even for the bookshelf, you can send it there and we can route it over to the bookshelf people as well. Thank you for your attention. We now have some time for some questions that you've written in the chat pod. And the head of the NCBI bookshelf group, Stacy Lathrop, is here and she can answer your pressing questions. Hi, this is Peter Cooper again. So we have one question so far, um, and this is directed to Stacy. I think. Would you be interested in a previous edition of a text if a new edition has already been published? Hi, thank you for your question. We do accept previous editions. Uh, we do prefer the most recent edition. We have some older editions, so if it's not the newest edition, we will take, say, the next uh, second to most recent one. Okay, thanks. Okay, here's a question. Um, how many books are on the NCBI bookshelf? 
We now have over 6,000 books in bookshelf. I do not have the exact number, but I can provide that in. I could do a search if I could. So the easiest way to see how many books we have on bookshelf would be to go to our browse titles page, which I'm clicking on here. And some of our books um, appear in our archives, so they're not in our default browse or search. Uh, this is usually for clinical content because we do also have a lot of systematic reviews and clinical guidelines where the currency is important. And for our agreements, we do not make these available by default. So the complete number of titles we have, we now have 6,042 titles. And we're pretty much adding between five and 20 a week. Uh, thanks, Stacey. Is there, here's another question. Is there an iPad, iPhone app for the bookshelf? We do not currently have an iPad or iPhone app. What we do have is we have what we call a pub reader version, which I can actually show you here. I'm just gonna click, this is actually a report rather than a textbook, but it will show you what we have. If you click on views to pub reader, it's an HTML5 page. You can't, you can do a find within the book, but you can't search across the resource. Um, the view looks differently, obviously, on a PC, or it is kind of device um, smart. So if you're on an iPad, you can, it will look pretty similar to this. And then on the iPhone, it doesn't scroll by page, it will just scroll down the page. So it's a little bit different on the iPhone which I can't show you, unfortunately. OK, thanks. OK, I think this will be the last question. Um, and this is, can students download the ebooks? Whether or not students can download the ebooks is dependent on the agreement that we have with the publisher. So if the publisher agrees to participate in our open access subset, which some publishers have, then you can go to our FTP and download the entire uh, XML files. And the, also whether or not you can download the PDF version of the book is also dependent on the agreement. Many do provide us to provide the PDFs, but not all of them. So really this is dependent on our agreements with the publisher. So let me show you a book where we have permission to download the PDF. Um, I'm not gonna choose a textbook. Well, here, let me do this one. The Handbook of eHealth Evaluation, the handbook. So I'm going to move back to the, well, you can see it here. You have a PDF, so you can download the PDF to read while you're not connected. And you can also switch to the classic view. And I can show you where it is in the classic view. Again, here you had the PDF. PDF version for download. I can show you where the open access subset is so that you can look where to find that. So you would go to our open access subset and then you would go to NLM Lit Arc FTP service which is a number of clicks and you go here and I'm gonna go to last modified. So there, there's an Excel file that shows all of the content that we have available for download. So these are all the book titles and it shows you the file directory that by which you can download the content. Okay, thanks, uh, Stacey, and everyone for coming. Um, let's go ahead and conclude the webinar, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming.